Hello and welcome back to New Year New Game. This is where I attempt to play 365 games in my Steam library that I have never played before. This is game 107, Crusader Kings 3. I've played Crusader Kings 2 before, and I, I didn't do very well. I didn't go through any tutorial mode for it, I just jumped in and thought, I've played real-time strategy games before, like Total War, I know exactly what I'm doing. I had no idea, I don't know how like the factions and vassals and all this kind of relationship with other kingdoms worked out. So, I thought with Crusader Kings 3, it would be fun to go through the tutorial because it is technically a new game and I do need to learn how to play it. And if I were to go through the tutorial, then it's no longer a new game at that point. So what you are going to be watching is me going through the tutorial and not completing the tutorial. There is a lot to learn and a lot to know about Crusader Kings 3. I gave it a thumbs up because the game design and mechanics, the long kind of little details and everything that they do, is a part of the game. This is something that the game is. And it's not that I disliked going through and learning all the mechanics. I think for entertainment wise, for like gameplays and things like this, uh, Crusader Kings is more enjoyed just by the individual playing and less likely by the people who watch it. Unless you're doing some type of like short compilation type thing and not like a live play by play like I do for an hour. So though this video might not be extremely entertaining, I mean who knows, you might just like the sound of my voice as I read pop-up prompts that come through the tutorial as I stumble my way through and trip over my tongue multiple times as I do to uh, try and figure out how to play Crusader Kings 3. It's all just based on the tutorial and I mean hey it could even be a learning experience for yourself by figuring out how this game is played and instead getting a wonderful narration by myself. So you get you know I don't know maybe the first half of the game you'll understand how this kind of works. Or some of you out there might be just fans of Crusader Kings 3 already found this video as a recommendation because it has the name and the game and the title and you'll just not like it at all and be like what is this person talking about this person does not know what they're doing you'd be right i don't it's a game i've never played before anyways i hope that you all will enjoy crusader kings 3 here on new year new, new game. game welcome to crusader kings 3 is a deep strategy game of dynasties and intrigue. If you are new to the world of Crusader Kings, we strongly recommend you play the tutorial. In the tutorial, you'll play as Petty King Merchad, a ruler in Ireland. Lead your family and dynasty to defeat your enemies and become King of Ireland. We definitely should play the tutorial because I have played the second Crusader King and I did not do too well. Definitely need to learn how to play it, though. Uh, welcome to Crusader Kings 3! You are a medieval ruler. Your reign may be brief, but through your heirs, you can bring your dynasty to promise. Lands in yours for the taking. Land is yours for the taking. By way of the sword or through marriage and clever diplomacy. Oh, excuse me can extend your reach far beyond the wildest dreams of any conqueror. There is no way to win in Crusader Kings 3, only different ways to enjoy your story as it unfolds. So you never actually win this game, huh? Uh, use WASD keys to move the camera across the map. You can also move the cursor to the edge of the screen to pan pressing the home key takes you back to your capital. Beep. To zoom in and out, scroll wheel, definition of forms, displays, and different zoom level details, maps, political map, and paper map. This is paper map. This must be political map. This is details map. Alright. Zooming in, you have the ability to select and manage your holdings. 
Zooming out gives you an overview of all the realms. Crusader Kings 3 spans hundreds of years and many generations. Right now, time is standing still because the game is paused. For this part of the tutorial, we'll keep the game paused while we walk you through some game concepts. Sometimes you will see the blue highlighted text. This means you can hover over the words to display an informative tooltip. Some of these tooltips may also have highlighted words, which can also be tooltipped for the future information. Duchy can lead to county, which can lead to brownie. Barney? Brownie. I don't know. Bronies. This is where bronies come in. By default, it takes a couple of seconds for a tooltip to lock in for mouse overs. This can be adjusted in the game settings. To continue, place your cursor over this highlighted text. Hover over the highlighted text phrase inside the highlighted text. Neat. Good job. Alright. Now let's talk about the game. Everything takes place on the map before you. The world consists of large and small territories, landed titles held by various rulers. Titles are represented by elaborate coats of arms shown as icons in the map. The icon represents your realm is that of your primary title, the most important and prestigious title you hold. If you hover over your character's portrait, the coat of arms over your realm capital, Luminechi, will glow, and the entirety of your realm will be highlighted. Munster is your primary title, which is why your realm is named after it. You also hold the Eldom of Thomond as a separate title. If you zoom out, it will read Munster on this part of the map because you are the top ruler of the area. Eh, monster. There it is. Oh, so it's just this. I thought it was the whole, whole of Ireland. Uh, next. As a ruler, you can only hold so much land on your own. You will often have other rulers helping with the administration of the realm by holding land titles within your borders making them your vassals. To find your own land, your domain, press the home key and zoom in. Once closer up, you can see blue labels on the baronies that belong to you. In this case, it'll only be Luminici. The Eldom of Ormond is held by your vassal. We go home, we zoom in. You saw this Luminici. Barony of, was it, Kimlock? Okay, I understand. You play one of many characters in this world, represented by character avatars. Your character is the ruler of a realm. You will need to make sure that your dynasty survives and thrives throughout the ages. Your titles give you power and control over territory, as well as over other characters who might hold titles and land of their own. Let's click on my character. Quite a few people here. Well, our grandparents have died. Our parents have died, too. Gotta sneeze. We don't have a spouse, but we have a kid. Characters have skills indicated their proficiency within a certain field. Some are great talkers, while others prefer to make their intent clear on the battlefield. So, main skills, diplomacy, we're not that great at that. Uh, martial, which is raising and commanding armies, that's where we thrive. Uh, raising and commanding armies, stewardship, we're kind of like second best at that. Uh, managing your personal lands, which is intrigue. Oh, wait a minute. Nope, I'm reading those wrong. Raising and commanding armies, which is our marshal. That's where we thrive. Managing my personal lands, that comes second. Scheming and finding secrets, that's our next one. 
And then studying theology and technology is what we are worse at. So I won't be getting any other technology. But you know what? We're going to do some damage. Early game damage. Characters also have traits, which can affect skills as well as how they react to things. These are illustrated by icons in the character view. Some traits tell you about characters' personalities, like fickle, calm, or generous. Other traits are specific to how a character has lived their life, such as education trait or commander traits. So we are temperate. That gives us a bonus to our stewardship. Small boost to our health. Opinion of Tempest characters is up. Opinion of Gluttonous characters, down. We are also wrathful, which means we're not good at diplomacy or intrigue. But we have a wonderful amount of dread. Uh, unlocks the punish criminal interaction. Oh, we're going to be doing so much punishing. I'm talking heads on pikes. I'm going to be enjoying all of that. Uh, learning, even less. Uh, monthly prestige, up 20%. Opinion of liege, minus 5. Vassal opinions, minus 5. Hostile scheme power, plus 15%. And uh, expedite scheme decisions. Opinion of is it patient characters, minus 15. From this, you can see that your character typically leads a modest life and expects others to do the same. And it is quick to anger when they don't. Do as I say, or else. When a character chooses to behave contrary to their personality traits, they can cause them stress. Traits can also impact how other characters react to you. Some people are impressed by the brave trait, while a lustful character is more likely to feature in solace gossip. Oh, salacious gossip. Big words. Uh, ooh, ooh. excuse me. I'm going to be doing that quite a bit, I'm sure. Traits influence other characters' mortality and greed, which can affect both their friendly and hostile actions. All characters, yes, all, have an opinion of one another, which drives their behavior. Low, opinion can cause people to rise up against you or be unwilling to help you. High opinion can, on the other hand, make characters more inclined to join your schemes. How you choose to interact with other characters will often affect their opinion of you. Well, I mean, they're, they're pretty good on me right now. Brian? Brian's nice. Ah, uh, dude. Gold. Gold. Uh, the future. Oh, to further your goals, you will need gold. Uh, among other things, gold pays for buildings, armies, and bribes. Gold is collected passively from both your holdings and your vassals as tax. Larger vassals and more important holdings tend to give more tax. However, money can't buy everything. Certain things can only be achieved by spending the right amount of prestige or for religious matters. Piety. Uh, you can see the current stats of your gold prestige and piety in the bar at the top right. So that's our gold, our prestige. What kind of fame do we have? We are established. And then our piety. We are, uh, duitful? I don't know if that's a good thing. That doesn't seem like a good thing. Your prestige tells you how respected you are. It can be earned passively over time by holding many titles, for example, or actively, such as by marrying into prestigious dynasties or fighting as an ally in wars. Whenever you earn prestige, you build towards your character level of fame. Higher level of fame make other characters think better of you and bring powerful ways to wage war. Some actions cost prestige, like declaring war. These actions allow you to leverage your celebrity for your own benefit, and characters won't think less of you for using them. Spending prestige does not affect your level of fame progress, just your current prestige. And here's piety. With a lot of piety, 
you will have an easier time interacting with your head of faith. As you are Catholic, this is the Pope. Piety can be gained passively from the learning skill and virtuous titles are actively from pious actions such as going on a pilgrimage. You also have a level of devotion which builds over time whenever you can. Piety and can have positive effects for your character. Ugh. Got like an eyelash or something. Some hair in my eye. Just rummaging around in there. Similar to prestige, some actions require you to spend piety like declaring holy wars or creating a new faith. Spending piety like this is normal, and other characters won't think worse of you for it. Hooray! Lifestyles! As well as traits, your character can also pick a lifestyle. There are five lifestyles, one for each skill. Lifestyle represents what you put the most effort into day to day, and each one has several focuses inside relating to it. Every focus gives you a unique bonus and makes events associated with that focus more likely to happen. Alright, lifestyle button. Boom. Marshall, which is where I would assume our uh, thing would be going. Ah, must not have got that eyelash. It's on my glasses. No, don't see it. I'm gonna clean my glasses though. So far, I don't have my glasses cleaner in my pocket anymore. Great. Alright, Marshall, focus on control of your realm, honorable conduct, and the strategies that will win your arm or your wars. Because of my martial education, you gain 30% more experience in this lifestyle. We're all about the war. Click on any lifestyle to see its focus. As time goes by, your character will earn lifestyle experience for maintaining a particular lifestyle. When you acquire enough lifestyle experience, you can select one of the lifestyle perks from any of its trees. Perks represent your particip... What is it? Oh, practicing and developing yourself over time and offer unique bonuses like special traits or unlock lifestyle specific mechanics and content such as the ability to start abduct schemes as an example the strategy authority and chivalry focuses all grant martial experience which can be used to acquire any of the martial lifestyle perks completing perk trees Leads to different lifestyle traits. To continue, choose a focus. This one. <sighs> uh, choose a focus. Uh, Luck can win a duel. A fool can win battle. It takes more to win wars. Uh, let's see. It does give us plus three martial. Is that prowess? I don't really care for prowess. But honor... And that's really only plus three martial. Whereas this one's like plus three prowess and attraction. And advantage plus five. I think I'm gonna do that. Chivalry focus. There's also the authority. Plus one martial or dread gets plus twenty percent control growth <laughs> zero point three. Let's do a chivalry focus. Woo. Alright. Moving on. Other characters. Interacting. Now, having selected a focus, you can move on to other people. Interacting with other characters is key in Crusader Kings 3. 
and you have many options for how to do so. You can right click on a character portrait including your own to get a list of potential interactions such as arranging a marriage or initiating a scheme. This is also where you start wars. But let's save that for later. Sit by right click. Educate child, find spouse, arrange marriage. Uh, open your character view. Right click your player's heirs character portrait to see the interaction available. Confirm a send gif interaction with your heir. Means 15 opinion of me and I give him 50 gold. Yeah, they, they really enjoy me. They're at 100. Well done, you have successfully increased someone's opinion of you. Note that feed message in the lower right this is where medley interesting but non-critical information appears and goes away after a little while when unpaused. Certain opinion modifiers last forever, like family bonds. Others will wave of, over time, like the fading memory of receiving a monthly gift. If you hover over your cursor over the opinion number, on another character, you can see exactly where the various numbers are coming from. It is due to a marriage alliance, a gift of gold, or simply that they appreciate your honest nature. Get that. Next, let's talk about your dynasty. Learn as the game goes on, unless your character meets with an untimely accident or terrible disease. They'll grow old and eventually die. The story doesn't end there. It's only game over if you do not have an heir of your own dynasty. Who? As long as your titles have heirs of your dynasty, your legacy will live on. When your current character dies, you simply start playing a new one. The player heir, depending on the type of succession your realm has, this is likely to be one of your children. Perhaps one that you have groomed to rule. Your dynasty has its own coat of arms, which is currently highlighted, and can be clicked for more information. You don't need to do anything with this now, but if you want to look at the details of your dynasty later, it can be found here. Yeah, I see that uh, there are children here. The child with the lovely beard is 100%, and uh, we have siblings, which look like brothers. No, oh, half-brothers. They don't like us very much. Okay. Uh, succession law determines how all titles and resources are divided between heirs when a character dies. You currently only have one heir, but let's take a look anyways. In some cases, when you take over your new character, you may even find that they are responsible for the ultimate, was it, untimely demise of your previous ruler. Open the realm view on the right side of the screen highlighted. Realm view. That's probably it right there. Boop. Just press E. Oh, up here. Realms. And then we inspect the successions tab. Alright. As a member of a dynasty, you also have renown, shared by everyone in your dynasty. Renown grows in several different ways and reflect how infamous your dynasty is, rather than just you. Increasing your renown will echo down the generations for your descendants, raising your level of splendor as the dynasty head, the most powerful member of your dynasty. Renown will allow you to unlock dynasty legacies that will benefit all of your kin. I understand. 
To ensure the future of your dynasty, you need family members getting married. Oh, you need family members. Getting married is a good start. But we cannot promise that you will marry for love. Love, who does that? Click on your character. Let's get married! For unmarried characters in your domain, you can set up marriages or bethrows by right-clicking on the character and choosing Find Spouse or Arrange Marriage. Uh, right-click and select Find a Spouse. Uh, choosing Find Spouse opens a list of potential spouses they hail from courts all over the world. Choosing Arrange Marriage also opens a list of potential spouses, but only with people from the court of the character you clicked. Your own character is visible on the left because this marriage needs your approval. Whoever is the liege of the other spouse will appear on the right side as the union will need their approval as well. Arranged marriages can be useful for matchmaking between your uh, quarters or for setting up a specific marriage alliance. For now, find spouses more relevant for our purposes. Next. There are many factors to consider when choosing a spouse. To help you out, there is a filter function highlighted available to pare down the list of candidates. Aspects to consider including potential alliances, skills, personality traits, expected fertility, and more. Whew, that's a lot. Some traits are congentile, congital, it's big words, meaning they might be inherited by your children. Perhaps someone with a trait like that is a good place to start. You can change your selection by clicking the clear characters button in between the character you are setting up to get married. Nothing will happen until you click send proposal. <clears throat> Excuse me. Alright. Oh, that's a lot of things. How old is our character? It's 39. One that's 17. Crazy. Uh, when you have selected two characters for your marriage, you are presented with the details of the union along with additional options such as having the marriage be maternal. Maternal marriage children will be born into their mother's house instead of their father's. Ooh, we can't have that. If you are happy with the marriage, go ahead and send an offer. This action usually takes a few days, but will make it instant for the tutorial. Get married, select a spouse for your character, and click Send Proposal to suggest the union. Hmm. Agnes, daughter of a Duke Dito. Evil Absolver. Unmarried location in Jutterbog. It is a Saxon Catholic. From House Wetton. And then we've got uh, Hundred Furch Bilden Mirthfall. Daughter of uh, Prince Bilden. Treacherous villain, unmarried, located in Merhendon, who is Welsh Catholic, and from the house Martha Fall. And then we have uh, Gwynelyn Furch Belden Martha Fall, daughter of Prince Belden, uh, resentfully lackey. What does that mean? She's a lackey? She's a resentful lackey? Unmarried, located in Myrdun, also Welsh Catholic, and from House Martherfall. Uh, and then we have Denise Furch Bilden Martherfall, daughter of Prince Bilden, an evil lackey, unmarried, located in Myrdun. So, right away I noticed the negatives in them, so negative 6 and negative 11 are out. Uh, plus 4s, though, kind of in. It's an evil absolver. And this is all about, like, House Mirthafall. I want to say, uh, no to House Mirthafall. There are very many. Oh, there's more if I scroll down. So many more. 
Such the options. This is a plus 14. Interracial lackey. Quarter of Duke Arthur the second unmarried, located in province uh, Oxtison Catholic. Potential alliance. Oh, there's other things here. Has claims on the following titles. Country of Flores. Any of these ones have cool things? Has claims on the following titles. Jesus. It's a lot of claims. Everything's like potential alliance with these things. Hmm. I mean, having more titles is good. That's a lot of titles. God, this list can just keep going and going. Deceitful. I don't know about that. I don't think we should do deceitful. Let's just like plus 27. We're like a perfect match. Forgiving, arrogant, and generous. We'll, we'll pick this one. Yeah. Where do we hit set a proposal? I right click it. Arrange marriage. Murder. Uh, get married, select a spouse for your character, and select send proposal. I don't see a send proposal. Is that only like in these ones here at the top? I mean, there's arrange marriage. Ship, no. Then go to them. Yeah, I don't see an option that says. Says. Select spouse. Where character select send proposal to suggest the union. I don't see that anywhere. I don't understand why I don't see that anywhere. It's plus 14, that's what, plus 27. Where am I missing it? Seduce, romance, sway. Invite to court. Oh, I would have to pick a spouse. I don't want to do that. No, back. Exit. Ah, oh, heck, now I missed out. Find spouse. Alliance power. It's a lot. That's so, wow, 10 and 6. That's. Maybe we don't need to be that powerful. Prestige gain. Yeah. Rank. Opinion of me. Oh, okay, so the pluses are for people who have been a good opinion of myself. I mean, we think about our alliance. I really don't want to do that, though. Uh, prestige gain. Why is this still the same? I said prestige gain. Alliance power? No. Rank? I'm gonna do rank. There. Okay, so certain characters it does allow you to do it. I guess you just can't send proposals to every person. Uh, yeah, send proposal. <laughs> to the amical petty king merchant of Munster, I, Morena, gladly accept your hand in marriage. May Saint Bird bless our union, my amical husband. Excellent. Hey, went up to a plus 79. 
They really like us. Excellent. May you live long and happily together. It's going to be the death of me. You may have noticed the toast message at the top of the screen. Toast messages deliver quick fire information that is relevant to you or your character. Marriages are also usually accompanied by an event, as your potential spouse liege accepts or rejects your offer with a letter. There are different kinds of events, and they are critical to shaping your destiny, so keep an eye out for them. For this tutorial, we recommend that you use Find Spouse for your son as well. As soon as your son is married, he can start producing members of your family and heirs to your titles, who are of your dynasty? Well, all right, you heard it. This is for the alliance. Alliance power. This person does not like you. Zero. Not even born yet. Something wrong with this game. Uh, I think this is just what we're doing. There's, there's more titles with this lady. There. Okay. I was clicking on them themselves and not like on the thing. Uh, both get 200. And some proposal. Alliance form with Duke Gulhemvil of Iquantian. To the amicable petty king Muchad of Munster, I gladly accept your marriage proposal. Oh, we're marrying this guy. Uh, your son and heir Brian and my sister Beatrice will be joined in holy matrimony. May God grant them long life and many children. She hates me. <laughs> Ambitious, short reign, cultural acceptance, personal. Well, these personals just, you know, not that low. Uh, patient versus impatient. Oh. Alright. And they don't like me either. That's not good. Alright, I understand. Uh, family is important. The player heir will always come from your dynasty, and most often from your house. In the future, it won't hurt to keep an eye on your family and their line of succession. Depending on their succession laws, you might end up inheriting titles, along with land and vassals from your relatives. Not everyone in your dynasty will be land owners, but every plot of land on the map has an owner. Sometimes the owner is you, sometimes it's one of your vassals, and sometimes it's another realm entirely, many of whom also have or are vassals. Most titles belong in a pyramid-like hierarchy according to their title. Uh, barony ruled by a baron or baroness, a county ruled by a count or countess, a duchy, duchy ruled by a duke or duchess, a kingdom which is ruled by a king or queen, and an empire ruled by an emperor or empress. Every title is legally part of a title one tier up the chain. For example, each county is thus part of a duchy. Note, there are many dynamic names for these titles. Your current ruler is in charge of a petty kingdom, which corresponds to the duchy t ter terror. So we're a dutch. We are a dutch. We say legally, because as Crusader Kings 3 lets you play with history, there is no way to guarantee that a king is actually in control of all the titles that his kingdom is supposed to contain within its borders. We call this title hierarchy. And if the structure has been broken, it is often possible to declare war over er errant territories. If you switch to the Duchy Titles map, mode, you can see that as the ruler of the Duchy of Munster, the country of Desmond should legally be part of your realm. Change to the Duchy title map mode. Boop. Uh, return to realms map mode. Let me see. Is this mine? It should be mine. 
This should be mine. It's a part of Munster. It's the mmm and Munster. Alright. Turn to realms. I can click that. But Desmond has it. We say legally. Oh, wait, no, I already read all that. I understand. The de jure title of Munster consists of four counties. Their names should be visible on the map. Thamon and Enos held by you, Desmond held by a neighboring ruler, and Ormont held by your vassal. These counties are made up of small pieces of land. Baronsness, Baronis, the individual holdings of a realm. Holding represents settlements in your land. Great. Lumak. Uh, click on your capital holding Lumak. Select bastions and current walls, or oh, curtain walls, among its buildings and upgrade the structure. That did. Do I gotta get like closer to it? There. Construct new building. Uh, you said curtain walls? Select bastion and curtain walls. Uh, among its buildings and upgrade the structure. It's going to take three years to upgrade this. Well done! It will take some time for the building to be ready, though. Yeah, three years, come on. Luminic wasn't built in a day. Feel free to close the walls and towers construction window. Well done, it'll take some time for the bilia. We did this, we read that. Uh, every holding... I'm gonna zoom out, because I'm tired of hearing that construction sound. Every holding provides taxes to their holder. If that holder is a vassal, they will, in turn, pay taxes to their liege. Taxes are your main source of gold income. Obligations can affect how high or low these taxes are. Being at war can affect the level of control in a country, which in turn affects taxes. Hate taxes. Just file taxes. As a ruler, you are likely to be the liege of at least one vassal. These are rulers who have sworn fertility to you and are thus part of your realm. Vassals supply you with gold, taxes, and soldiers' levies. It is possible to both be a liege and vassal at once. Open the realm view on the right side of the screen. Inspect the vassals tab. To the vassals! Earl Ragenvold II Sturgeonson of Ormond, who does not like me. With a negative seven... Uh, normal amount of taxes, realm size, powerful vassal. That's good to know. Uh, ba -ba. Here's a list of your current vassals, along with some additional information about them. At the top of the list is the ruler of Ormond, whose land you can see on the map. This is an earldom, a county tier title inside your realm. Come here for an overview of things, such as your vassal's current opinion of you, whether they are considered a powerful vassal or not, and the levels of taxes and levies they are currently providing you with. Can we, like, just... Dismiss? There we go. Yeah, we sent the gift. We did that. Let's... Okay. Uh, it's worthwhile keeping your vassals happy. This keeps them out of schemes and factions against you. No matter how mighty a ruler your character is, if your realm unites against you, either to dispose you through war or just to murder you while you sleep, your reign is bound to be cut short. Some of your vassals might serve on your council, making their opinion extra important as they will be trusted with counselor tasks. 
Uh, there is a limit to how many vassals you can comfortably be in charge of before your realm becomes unwieldy. Going beyond this vassal limit affects taxes and levies provided to you. This doesn't matter for the tutorial, but when you start to build your own kingdom, be mindful of growing too fast. I have that problem. Just such a fast grower. I really expand. If you end up exceeding your vassal limit, you can grant lower tiered titles to your vassals. Sometimes you can even create new high tier titles to consolidate your power in a region and strengthen your hold over the lower titles de jure subsequent to your new titles. I understand. I'm gonna forget all this by the time the tutorial's over. I don't even know why I selected to do a tutorial. This is what the hour video is gonna be, is me reading the tutorial. Hopefully we get through it in the hour. Your realm is the complete body of land and titles that you control, including the areas held by your vassals. Right now, for you, this means that the counties called earldoms, earldoms, due to your Irish culture, of Enis, Fomond, and Ormond, uh, when domain is used, we are instead referring to the land that you own personally without vassals. Enis and Thomond. <sighs> Some things that happen will only affect your domain, Enis and Thomond, while other things will impact your entire realm, the Duchy, or Petty Kingdom. Of Munster. Uh, not that there is a limit to how much land you can hold personally before you start incurring penalties. The domain limit. When you go above your domain limit, it can be a good idea to use the grant title interaction on characters you are friendly with, making them your vassals. As you have no spare titles to give away, you cannot currently do this, but you would otherwise find it in the character menu, visible when right-clicking on a character. I understand. Councils. <sighs> Managing a realm is a lot of work, so I was going through this tutorial. As a ruler, you have the help of your council. These can be either vassals or members of your court, and they act as your trusted advisor. There is a consul position corresponding to each skill, and married rulers will also have their spouses assisting them. Open the consul view highlighted. Hey, look at that. Uh, Consulars can be set to work, and they all do different things. You can change a counselor's task by clicking the button near their portrait in the consul view. Being a counselor is a prestigious position. Powerful vassals uh, expect to be appointed and will be unhappy if left out. Uh, fabricate claim on county. Religious relations. Possible side effects, loss of piety, loss of vassal opinion. Oh, no. Uh, this person... Hmm, my, my realm priest does not endorse me. They've seen me do some things with uh, parts of my body that a priest should not be looking at. Uh, schemes or long-term goals amid at another character. They can have hostile goals like trying to murder or abduct your target to be more wholesome, such as the befriend scheme. Open the intrigue view highlighted. Inspect the schemes tab. It should be open by default. All right, it opened by default. Look at that tab. Hostile schemes, we have none. Personal schemes, we have none. And discovered secret schemes, of which we have none. Moving on. A good time to use schemes might be when you find the line of succession to not be as clear-cut and favorable as you'd like. One way to get ahead is to simply remove the competition. Quietly, and with no witnesses. A murder attempt comes with a risk of discovery. If your attempt goes awraw, 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 it will make your character unpopular, especially 
with your intended target. Makes sense, I get it. The sway scheme is made for increasing the opinion someone has of your character. Let's try it. Open the console view highlighted. Right click your court chaplain, my bishop, and choose the sway scheme. We're gonna send him some roses. Uh, let's start this game. Alright, started a sway scheme against a Q Q Q I can see why he doesn't like us. Excellent! Once set in motion, your scheme will slowly progress over time. The time before conclusion is reached varies based on the scheme's success chance, which can be affected by relevant skills. In this case, it is affected by your diplomacy. If you're unhappy with your scheme, you can always cancel it by clicking the Abandon Scheme button next to the scheme. Open the Intrigue view highlighted. Inspect the Schemes tab. Here we are. We got a 65% chance of this person liking me in 23 months. Hooray. Sometimes schemes can give rise to secrets. If you catch someone trying to commit murder, it's probably in their best interest to make sure you keep it quiet. You can also blackmail them to gain a hook. Hooks represent a favor you can call in or a hold you have over a particular character, letting you encourage, encourage or force them to do your bidding. As you play, you'll find many different ways to gain and use hooks. Experiment with them. Next, let's pretend you have managed to get a hook on one of your vassals. Yay, we're pretending. Uh, am I supposed to click this? Alright, hook gained. We've gained favor hook of Earl Ragnvold, who also doesn't really like us. This weak hook can be used for a number of things. For example, you can increase the obligations set by the feudal contract you have with a feudal vassal. To access the menu for changing your feudal contract, go to your vassal list in the realm view or right click his portrait to choose modify feudal contract. You may notice that some interactions are not immediately visible. When you have many interactions available, the character interaction menu only displays the most common ones. To display missing interactions, click the more button in a category. You understand? Whoa. That's part 15, Jesus. War is an essential part of Crusader Kings 3. There are many concepts to cover, but for now let's touch briefly on some of them. The rest in the details we will let you discover as you start playing. Oh, I just get to stumble across war, that's cool. The most important events in any war are the battles, which are fought by armies. Most of your soldiers will come from levies, but you can expand your army by exploring men-at-arms. If things get really tough, you can also hire mercenaries, provided you have the gold. Open the military view. Holla at it. There's our levies. There's our knights. Our men-at-arms. Uh, the most important events in any wars are the battles, which are fought by armies. Most of your soldiers... Ah, we read that already. Uh, we opened it. Cool. Next. When a war starts, you can raise your armies with a single click of the big red Raise All Armies button that will appear together with the war score icon to the lower right of your screen. Uh, you can, of course, raise all armies from the military view as well. When a war is over, you have dis to disband your soldiers before starting another war. The rally point points are mustering grounds for the levies and man-at-arms under your command this is where they will appear when called to war next uh, to start a war you'll need a legitimate reason a casus belli against another ruler there are various ways to obtain a casus belli you might have digital titles that make you the rightful liege of your target 
you might inherit claims, or you could pursue holy wars against nearby infidels. Although these are the most common, there are dozens of different types of cast spells for you to discover and use as you play. The easiest and most straightforward way to acquire claims is to use Fabricate Claim on County. This is something your court chaplain sees to, though one of his counselor's tasks. Oh, through one of his counselor's tasks. Sweet. Almost there! Unpausing. Soon we'll let you unpause the game. There are just a few things to go over first. Firstly, it's important to know that there are five different speeds available to for you to play at press keys one through five to easily switch between them and you will be able to pause or change the pace whenever you want. Secondly, for certain important events, the game will auto-pause for you. There's nothing wrong with playing at lower speeds and increasing the speed when things are quiet or slowing it down when you go to war. Generally, we recommend you pause the game when inspecting menus or when you are faced with tough decisions. To start the ticking of time, unpause the game using the spacebar or by clicking the play button in the lower right corner. This will let days, months, and years go by. Armies instructed to march will move, events will occur on screen, letters will be sent, and characters will age. Find a speed that is comfortable for you. You can always change that later. And now it's going. And now it ticks away time. Oh, hey. Uh, now as we... Hang on. It's, uh, oh, it's a wedding celebration. Me. Now as a first task, let's remind your neighbor, the Earl of Desmond, who has rightful liege truly is. If it happens to expand your realm, then so be it. Using the character interaction system that we went over earlier, um, and selecting him via the map, declare war on the ruler of Desmond. You should already have a valid Cassus Bell, as his title is de jure, a part of your realm. Declare war on Earl Mustin of Desmond. <sighs> Yeah, my council. That's not you. Hmm. Uh, can't do that. Yeah, I don't know where this person is. Realms. I got this thing here. Of my marriage to Countess Marion, the realm expects us to throw a suitable extravagant wedding celebration. It is well within my right to collect a royal aid duty as part of this, but some of may consider it tasteless to levy an extra tax during a time of jubilation. Of course I will collect it. Who pays for their own wedding? I'll let my subjects enjoy the festivities without worry or care. Where did that kind of ruler? Alright, let's pause this because I gotta declare a war against a person. Uh, who are we trying to declare war against? Uh, the Earl of Desmond. I told you I would forget everything. Right off the bat, I don't know where the Earl of Desmond is. So we just click here. There you are. Earldom of Desmond. You, sir, I'm going to declare war on Earl Murdoch. Yep. Earl Murdoch of Desmond, can you yourself war declared against? Yes, yes we. Oh, well, I gotta choose a cashier spell. Uh, this one here. You gain the contested country. I have two allies, you have no allies, I have quite a powerful army, you do not. Hmm, vastly inferior, I say. Let's declare war. Now as a first task, let's remind your neighbor, the Earl of Desmond, who his rightful liege truly is. 
If it happens to expand your realm, then so be it. So this is something we've already read. Uh, raise all armies. You have successfully declared war. Next, you should rally your armies. A button has appeared at the bottom of your screen to help you, but you can also do this from your military view. We did that. Whenever your rally point is, in this case, Thadman, that's where your army will gather and await your orders. Note that you will have to unpause the game. Press the spacebar for your army to gather more than a handful of men. Levy for a few days in the army of restraint. I understand. Uh, let's pause. To move your army, click the army on the map and right click the area you want them to go. Over here. Uh, perhaps the enemy capital. Marnie. Yeah, I guess that's it. Is this Barner? Barney? Yeah, yes it is. Uh, if you order your army across waters, it will embark turning it into a fleet. For now, let's stay on that. I understand. Uh, now that your army is moving very slowly, uh, it is probably heading into battle with enemy forces. This can be a head on encounter with other armies. Oh, it's happening right now. We're watching it unfold. Look at this excitement. Oh, we went down quite a bit. They're trying to flee. Look at them run. Ah, uh, battles will happen automatically. A siege occurs when you place your army on enemy holdings. This is a good time. Stand still and your armies will not move. I understand. Your army is attacking enemy holding. Click the highlighted icon. It's, I'm just gonna pause. We're fighting again. They do not stand a trance against us. Again we win. Quick pause. I'd like just take a read. Can we just... Give me a moment here. Uh, you need to win sieges to win most wars. They increase your war score. Whenever a siege is won, it takes a few rounds of attacks. The area will become occupied, changing its regular look on the map from a solid color to a striped color when zoomed out. Okay. Uh, the color of the stripes show who has occupied a holding. Since the color on the map is green, holdings that you have occupied will have green stripes. So holding occupied by the Kingdom of France, however, would have blue stripes and one occupied by the Kingdom of England, red, so on and so on. Gotcha. To get an idea of who is winning in a war, you can also look at the war score in the lower right corner. It goes from minus 100 to plus 100 and changes based on battles and sieges won or lost as well as territory occupied. At 100 score, you can force the other side to accept your peace offer. Uh, conversely, at neg negative 100 war score, they can force you to accept their peace offer. We're at 50. All wars end in one of three ways. Victory, white peace, defeat... The exact consequences of any of these changes, depending on the case, you should bail. The details for a specific war can be found in the right clicking. And that is an hour, all spent in the tutorial. This is a very extensive game, and I knew this when selecting it. That there is just a lot of things to do in Crusader Kings. I played the second one, I did not do too well, but I also did not go through this tutorial to attempt to understand how most of this works. Here's the other thing. I'm going through the tutorial. I still feel like I don't understand how most of this works. Like, I like kingdoms and, and battles and things like this. This gets really down to every fine detail, which is something that is liked about Crusader Kings. Uh, depending really on who you are as a person who likes to play these kinds of kingdoms battles, you may very well like this. The small details, the vassals, the kingdoms, the tr branching, the alliances and everything like that. Getting into like really Game of Thrones kind of territory. That's all really neat. It's especially neat in when you say it like on paper or, you know, speak it aloud. When you're going through trying to learn everything, it can almost seem a bit overwhelming or a tad bit too much. 
For me, I personally play games like real-time strategy games, which is what I was looking to play today. And this is what I came across. was like I've been putting off playing Crusader Kings 3 for a while. I'm used to games like Total War. Where it's essentially like, here's your kingdom. These are your armies. There are the enemies. Raise your kingdom. Make it ha Make your people happy. Put a governor in there. Certain special things that you can do. And then take your army and go attack that army. And then watch the armies fight in such an epic way. That's the kind of ones that I used to. This one doesn't look like you really get to see the armies fight besides a little screen with things that are moving. So, I mean, that kind of takes away the excitement of it. But then again, maybe the excitement of this game, as it has stated in here, is more so the story that is unfolding and being told by your choices and your actions. Which is also why I think Crusader Kings is a good game. Unfortunately, we did not really get a in too deep into like the mechanics of the game just because we were learning. And uh, I personally should have played this game more as like its own thing once I learned how to play the game. I did it for New Year New Game because I already know I was going to be procrastinating playing this game like I do so many games in my Steam library. And I figured if I go through and play in this way and get through the tutorial and things like that, then at that point, can I kind of learn and understand how all this works to the point where I can even make it a series at some point. Um, as for making this a series, I don't know if I will or not. It's a very long kind of base game, and I do think it would be entertaining, but more so entertaining for the person playing the game as opposed to the person watching the person playing the game. I don't know of too many Crusader Kings videos out there with the exception of like watching Yogg's cast play multiplayer but I think the entertainment in that is the members of Yogg's cast talking and playing games with each other and getting upset over decisions that are happening but you're not really focusing so much on what decision everyone's making as you are just enjoying the company of the people there um, or watching spiffing Brit break this game I have seen him do a couple of these things and that still has like a lot of speed runs and cuts and things like that that kind of just get to the interesting parts not the long drawn out of how long this game will take to complete and play so I will give this game a thumbs up I do believe that it is a interesting in the sense of its mechanics and the way that it plays and if I learn to play it more I would enjoy it for myself personally anyways I hope that you enjoyed Crusader Kings 3 if you would like you can purchase it it is available on Steam and if it happens to be available through Humble Bundle which I'm sure it is I will include a link in the description below you can click on that link purchase it from there and a small amount gets sent to my humble bundle wallet which I use to purchase more games because more games is more good anyways thank you all for watching and I'll see you in the next game goodbye